We talk about trust a lot, don't we? That's one of the topics that comes through in the songs that we sing in uh, how we understand the scriptures, how we bring forward. It is a major component of our life as Christians. The Bible, I was going to say strongly suggests, but really commands us to trust in God, doesn't it? It says explicitly, put your trust in God because really there is nothing else. Everything else is going to go by the way. As you've read in Revelation, everything eventually is going to pass by. And all that will be left is God and the kingdom of God. So really, from beginning to end of the story, there's nothing else. We, as followers of Christ, consider the Bible to be trustworthy. That is, we have either been told or we have investigated on our own the validity of God's word. That is, we, we take God's word as it's written here as what he's saying to us. And we build our faith on that, what it commands us to do here, what it tells us we should be, what it tells us we should avoid. Uh, we take those things as coming directly from the mouth of God. He speaks it, we read it, and we act upon it. Now, trust is not limited just to our life as Christ followers. We trust in all areas of life. Hopefully, somewhere in life, you have people that you trust without question. That whatever they say or whatever they do, you can trust them to have integrity in what they're saying or what they're doing. And so if that person or people was to come in and say, uh, I saw little green men outside, you would take that person at face value, you would never question it, you would accept it as fact. Now those people sadly seem to be kind of few and far between. You maybe have a handful of those people in your life. More likely, you have people that you trust, um, but you take a more Reagan-esque approach to them. That is, uh, for those of you old enough to remember, uh, you trust, but you verify. So if this person came in and said, I saw little green men outside, you would say, yes, I believe you think that. And you would go outside and see for yourself, wouldn't you? Yeah. So, so that's, that's more commonly the kind of people that we have in our life. And sadly, uh, we have people in our life that we don't trust at all. That through their actions or through us investigating something that they have presented to us as fact, we have come to understand that they don't tell us the truth. So we have those, those three areas of life in which we, we constantly have to vary our trust. We have, to, we have to look at the person, look at what they're telling us, look at their past actions, and say, okay, I, I trust completely, I trust, but I'm going to verify, I, I don't trust you at all. Whichever the case may be, we have those people in our life. And it gets to be exhausting, doesn't it? It's something that you would prefer more towards the front end, that whatever they say, you can take it as truth, and you don't have to put any effort into it. I, I love people like that. Even the people that you have to verify once in a while what they're telling you, that's not terribly exhausting. Uh, but the people at the bottom end of the scale that, that you, you can't trust at all, or you have very, very little trust, it just saps all of your energy. And what we discover through just those interactions is that we have to be intentional about building up our, our trust muscles. We, we have to be you know, always working at evaluating people quickly, evaluating and making decisions on what people are sharing with us, evaluating what their actions are. If we spent all of our time saying, okay, now wait a minute, let me go think about what you've just told me, or the world would come to a halt. So we need to be able to say, you said this to me, I accept it as fact, I don't have to question, I don't have to look into it, and we move on. 
at the other end of the scale, yeah, we have to devote more time to thinking about it because we don't want to get into the habit where uh, those people at the, at the lower end of our trust scale, uh, that those people, we don't ever believe them. That's, that's what the, the fable about the boy who cried wolf was about, right? We, we want to be able to believe those people, but we have to build up our ability to first decipher whether or not they're telling us the truth, and then secondly, help them to see the advantages of telling the truth. So be, it, it requires, just like we've talked about in the past couple of weeks, for us to be prepared, for us to constantly work at things and, and develop a, a bigger and a stronger trust muscle, a bigger, more robust trust in people. So the question then is, how do we do that? The nice thing as, as Christ followers is that we have two things that we can always bank on, two things that we can go back to in evaluating truth. Number one is the Bible, and number two is the experience of God's people throughout history. Now, whether you believe that the Bible is true because somebody told you that, or you sang a little song about it, or you, you just accepted from the beginning that the Bible is true, that's one side, or you may have devoted some time to investigating it. The Bible says this happened at this time in history with these people, and you go back and you find out that that's absolutely true, that people independent of the Bible verify that this happened, great. You do that a couple, three times, I absolutely accept whatever the Bible says is what the Bible says, and it's true, and I move on from there. So you've got that foundation. The second thing is the experience of the people of God. We tend to think about history in terms of our lifespan sometimes. So when I say the experience of the people of God, we look around us, we think about the people in our, our circle of uh, acquaintances, and we say, what's their experience? But the nice thing about the Bible and the history of God's interaction with people is it goes back all the way to the beginning. Has God been trustworthy with people? Have people encountered God in the way that the Bible says that they do? Have the things that people have gone through from here to here to here to here throughout history been true? And if we come to find that they're true, then we can build upon those examples if God comes through, for example, when we find ourselves in a furnace, is it possible that he will come through a second time? Yes, it is. If we are faced with a lion on the road on the way home, is it possible that God may come through? Yes, it is. And we know this to be true because we find it in the experience of God's people. I don't know if you guys ever uh, read these books. This, this, I think it was the first or second one, The Case for Christ by, by Lee Strobel. Now, if you don't know the background of, of this, Lee Strobel was a newspaper reporter, an investigative reporter, a non-Christian. And his wife came home one day and she says, you know what, I'm a Christian now. I'm sure there was more to it, but you get the point. I'm a Christian now, and gosh, I'd like you to be too. And he said, no way, no how. I don't believe any of that. Well, either the spirit moved in his wife or the spirit moved around him. He made a deal. He said, I will investigate the truths of Christianity in the same way that I would investigate a news story. That is, I will gather sources, I will go and, and verify that what those sources are telling me is true, and then I will make a decision. So what he does, uh, in particular here, is he goes around and he asks the types of questions that a newspaper reporter would ask about Jesus. So for example, we take the four Gospels, the biographies of Jesus, and say, these are facts about Jesus. Now, when people read the four Gospels, one of the first things they do is go, well, these are all different. How could it be true if four different people have come up with four different presentations? And so what, what Strobel does is he goes and he goes to a foremost expert on the Gospels. 
fact, I, I think he went to Dr. Blomberg, one of my teachers, and, and he says, okay, here's what people say. Here's, here's what I read in the gospel. John's got this perspective. Matthew has this perspective. Mark's got this short little account. Luke is excruciating and, and so on. And Blomberg walks him through. This is why this says this. This is why John presents it this way. This is why Luke is writing the way that he, and he lays out the facts and then, and then stops. He says, there's all the facts that you need. So make your decision. So Strobel goes on and asks other questions. What about this? What about this? What about this? Well, at the end of it, he assembles his story. And he goes through and he, he looks at the facts. And he looks at all of the avenues that he could possibly dispute the truth of this or that or the other, and he can't find anything. He comes to discover that everything that he asked, every answer that he got, everything that he assembled in his research turned out to be true. That the experience of God's people through history was exactly as the Bible said that it was. That the stories of Jesus in the Bible are exactly as the same as, the same as they are. That the places identified in the, in the Old Testament, that the, that the movement of God's people from here to there to there to there, interacting with this king or that king, they're all true. And it's there that the Holy Spirit confronted him. Okay, now you know the truth. You have no avenue to dispute the truth of God's word anymore. You have no way of getting around this. So either believe or don't believe. Of course, the story is that Lee Strobel becomes a, an extraordinarily strong believer. And he's investigated Christ. And he's investigated Easter. He's investigated the resurrection. His, his latest book is, is The Case for Miracles. And he has gone with the same exact approach. Okay, this is what the Bible says. Can I verify if this is true or not? And so he has the word of God as his source. And he has the experience of God's people all throughout history to guide his research. And in every case, he comes back and says, this is true. So the question for us, how do we develop that kind of trust? How do we build that kind of trust in ourselves? And the answer is we go to the source. We go to God's word. We go to God's people's experience through history. And we verify that it's true. And based upon that, we make our judgments and we make our actions in that. That's one of the great things about the story of Daniel. It's one of the things that comes up over and over and over. If you have your Bible, we're going to go to Daniel chapter 2 this week. When the exiles find themselves in the enemy's land, they find themselves confronted with a new king, Nebuchadnezzar. They find themselves being enculturated into the enemy's ways. They find themselves renamed. They find themselves being told, you need to speak another language. They find themselves completely removed from all of their moorings. They, they're completely swept off their foundation. And if you're put in a position like that, if the, the exiles are put in this position, there might be a moment of doubt. We might have a moment of doubt if we were to find ourselves in that same spot. Does God really care for me? Is God really going to come through on his promises? Is what God has told me true? Because I find myself in a different place at a different time doing different things now. And the, the reality is if they waited until they were in exile, if they waited until they were faced with the king, if they waited until they had to make these new choices to develop their trust in what God had said, to develop their trust in God's promises, well, they would have failed. They would have failed miserably. But the thing about the exiles is that they had been prepared from their youngest days to trust in what God said, despite what they see. 
to trust in the promises and the direction of God, despite what their experience was. And so even though God had said, you're my people, you are going to be my example here on earth, you are my cherished possession, and when they are swept away into exile, at that moment where they could have easily doubted what God had said about them, what God had said to them, what God had promised to them, they could have doubted that. Because they had spent so much time developing their trust in God, it was just a new place and a new time and new names and a new culture and a new everything. But in no way do they mistrust God. That's, that's just at, on every page in every chapter of this book. The beginning of chapter two, 2 starts like this. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, may the king live forever. I love that. Butter him up a little bit. May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. Now, every time I read that, every time I get to that point, I stop and go, well, that, that just makes common sense. If you came to me and said, hey, I, I had a dream. Can you tell me what it means? Well, I think the first thing I would ask you is, well, tell me what the dream is. Because I know I have no ability to, to decipher that. But the king thought different. In verse 5, the king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, ooh, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. So the king has placed all of the astrologers and enchanters and magicians and other assorted workers in a difficult spot. He said, no, you need to tell me what the dream is. Now, why Nebuchadnezzar all of a sudden doesn't trust his magic workers, we're not told. I don't know. Maybe they've let him down. Maybe they have proven not to be as trustworthy as they have told him that they were. And so they, they go through their usual posturing, right? Oh, hail to the king. Now, oh, tell me what the dream is. And they don't say this out loud, but, and I will interpret it. I will make up an interpretation that will satisfy the king, right? And the king says, I don't trust you no more. What I want is for you to tell me what my dream was and tell me what it means. So really, he's calling them on the carpet. He said, I don't think you can do what you say you're going to do. I don't think you're as trustworthy as you tell me you've been trustworthy. I think you might be trying to mislead me. Now, the trouble with this, if you remember the end of chapter 1, that this motley assemblage of magicians and sorcerers and enchanters and astrologers and other assorted wise men, that now includes the four teenagers that we've been talking about. You see, Daniel is now in this group because the king found him so wise in choosing the, the Daniel diet. He found him so wise in looking as good and being as smart as he was. The king had said, you join this crowd over here. You're part of my, my trusted crew. So Daniel is in trouble. And when he gets word that the king is taking a rather negative view on this, we might think that he might be mistrusting of God. Why have you put me in this situation in chapter 2 of the book? Why are you facing me with death all of a sudden? Well, they go back and forth and the astrologers say it's impossible, it can't be done. So the king orders them all killed. He said, I'm, I'm done with you. So I'm going to pick up in verse 12. 
This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon, including Daniel and his buddies. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. Now there's, there's another way of saying that God is softening one of Nebuchadnezzar's guys towards Daniel. Daniel is once again proving his God-given wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Ariak then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for more time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Daniel wisely says, I need more time. Daniel says, I need more time. Now, the enchanters and sorcerers and magicians had also asked the king for more time. But now all of a sudden, suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar is more than willing to give Daniel time that he wouldn't give to the other magicians. Now, who's at work here? You remember chapter 1. God's at work. God is at work. God is saying, Nebuchadnezzar, you will be soft-hearted. You will be kind and patient with my people because I'm planted. Now, he doesn't say this out loud, but this is how he moves Nebuchadnezzar. He has a softness of heart towards Daniel and the other teenagers. He says, give them all the time they need. Now, watch what Daniel and his buddies do. They don't sit down and they don't try to concoct a story that will satisfy the king. They don't sit down and try to come up with some way to get out of this trouble. They don't sit down and try to figure out a way around all of this problem that they're faced with. They pray and they go to sleep and they put the matter in God's hands. They do this. Because they have complete trust that what God is doing, the way that God is working things out, the way that God is arranging things is exactly the way that he wants it to be. So if they should not wake up from their nap, if God should not reveal things to them, if they should be killed with all the other wise men of Babylon, so be it. They trust they trust in the larger story of God. They are trusting in the promise of God all the way back at the garden to work things out for good somewhere, somehow in the distant future. And if it means that at this moment, Daniel and his buddies have to be put to death, well then so be it. God is still continuing to be at work throughout. This is the trust that they bring into Babylon. This is the trust that God has instilled in them. If at that moment they panicked, if at this moment, at the, at the crisis moment of everything, they had doubt, they doubted that God would come through, they did not trust that God would live up to his promise, the whole story would have been over. It would have been chapter two, the end. Because Daniel would have been put to death, but that's not God, what God is doing. That's how God is working things out. So calm are the teenagers that when they plead for mercy, God, show us the answer that we need to give to the king. That's all we ask. Show us the dream. Show us the answer, the interpretation to the dream. And we will... We will, as you trust us with that, be trustworthy in presenting that truth to the king. And then what do they, I love this. They don't jump up and go back to the king and say, we've prayed to God, he's going to give us the answer, just hang on, 
they just go to sleep. They sleep the sleep of angels because they trust that God will come through or they trust that God won't come through and this might be the end of their days, but they trust, they trust in the experience of God's people. They trust in the scriptures that they know thus far, they trust that what God is doing is for good. And they say, whatever you do, God, whatever answer you give to us, some answer, no answer, the answer in full, whatever it is, we will just be just fine. Because as soon as they wake up, as soon as Daniel has been given the vision, he wakes up and praises God for what? Because he can be trusted. Listen to this. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are His. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in the darkness and light dwells with Him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the King. You, God, have demonstrated that you are the one thing that we can trust in this life. And we can trust that you're working out for good. So Daniel goes back to the king. Daniel went to Ariok, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Ariok took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also known as Be oh, gosh. Belteshadzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no. Daniel replied, no. I can't do this. No wise man, no enchanter, no magician, no diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. Underline this in verse 28. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. And then he goes and interprets this. Now, what's interesting is that the passages that follow what I just read are the thing that most people remember about this chapter. They go, okay, the statue, and its head is like this, and its torso is like this, and its thighs are like this, and its feet are like this, and, and this means this, and this means that, and, this, and, and none of that helps us. You see, the answer there, the answer that Daniel is giving him is not something that you and I should dissect. It's not something that you and I want to devote building our trust to because what Daniel is describing is close in history from Nebuchadnezzar's time. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar's on top right now. He's the king of all that he can see right now. But Daniel says, well, that ain't going to last forever. And then there's going, to king a come, there's going to come a kingdom after that, and another one after that, and another one after that. And then nothing. Because there's only one kingdom that's going to last forever. That's the message of this lengthy passage. There's only one king and one kingdom that will last forever, and that is the kingdom of the God who just revealed this to you. That no matter what you experience, no matter what you're going to see in near history, no matter what Babylon, what, what happens in Babylon from here on out, none of that matters. Because the only kingdom that will last forever is the kingdom of God. And that's, that's why God has given him this detailed vision. That's why God has given him all of this truth. So that Nebuchadnezzar would, would maybe, maybe if he really worked at it, come to develop some trust in Yahweh, in the God of the exiles. After Daniel tells him all of this detail, he picks up again in, in verse 46. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be prepared to him. The king said to Daniel, surely your God is the God of gods. He's still fuzzy on the concept. Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you were able to reveal this mystery. And then look what God does. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. You know, just in, that, just in that story, we find that, that moment, you know, just one after the other of, of doubt. That moment where trust could be shaken. Where if Daniel was in a position of having to trust but verify, he wouldn't have any way of doing so. Daniel either completely trusted in God. Daniel either completely, without question, without having to check, trusted in the goodness of God, in the fact that God was working all things for good, or he didn't. And that's what the story is about. That's, that's the key to the entire book of Daniel. It's not this book of mysteries that we should spend all of our time trying to decipher and figure out the secret aspects of it. It is a story of trusting in God without question, despite the circumstances, despite what you face. We haven't even gotten to the furnace and the lions and all of that stuff yet. And yet Daniel will not be shaken. The teenagers will not be shaken because they have developed the necessary trust in God in order to be put in this position. You see, God's at work here. God has intentionally placed His people in this place. God has intentionally taken His most trustworthy and put them in positions of trust in the enemy's camp. God has intentionally walked them right out to the edge of trust so that when they appear before King Nebuchadnezzar and say, this is a fact, this is an indisputable fact, Nebuchadnezzar has nowhere to go but to either believe it or disprove it. And when he finds it to be true, he too, and it doesn't say he becomes a believer, he is not a Yahweh follower, but he's beginning to see that the things he has placed his trust in, that the men that he has trusted, his enchanters and magicians and, and all these other guys, they're maybe not as trustworthy as he thought they were. But this God of Daniel, this God that these people have brought into his kingdom seems to know a lot more than all these other guys that he has trusted. And so that will, that will contribute to moving the story forward. So the question that you and I have, coming back to the two things that, that we can put our trust in is, are we trusting, are we trusting in the right things? I mentioned, I think a couple of weeks back, that the two most popular books among persecuted Christians today, they're not, they're not John, not, they're not any of the Gospels or any of Paul's writings. They are Daniel and Revelation. And when you stop and you say, why? Why those two books of all of the other great and wonderful pieces of Scripture? And the reality is because in both of those books, unquestionably, God is in control. God is in absolute control. And that despite what they face, despite what happens to them, despite the challenge that comes their way, you were reading from Revelation this week and the week before and the week before, despite what happens, who wins in every instance? God wins. Who's in control of how history is unfolding? God is in control. Who's working all things for good? God alone is working all things for good. 
And so when we ask ourselves, what does it take to build that kind of trust? What would it take for you and I, when we are threatened with our life, what would it take if everything about our life changed? What would it take for us to be fully in trust in God? What would it take? How are we preparing ourselves to have this kind of trust? To be able to simply pray to God and trust in His answer and just nod off and go to sleep. I'm willing to bet that a lot of times you and I have prayed to God, don't shake your head yes or no, that we have prayed to God, that we have brought some difficult issue in our life before God, we have presented it to Him, and we've still laid awake in bed. You're smiling, that's a giveaway. <laughs> we have said, God, I completely trust you. I have complete and unalterable trust in you. And the answer that you're going to give me, no matter what it is, I trust that that's the right thing. And, and, then, and then we've closed our eyes, right? And then we've laid there staring at the side We've turned over and we've stared at whoever's sleeping there and then we've turned back up. We've looked at the ceiling. We've laid awake hour after hour because we, we trust God, uh, but, but we, we trust God. We trust God, but there, there can't be any but. We, we've got to remove the but from that statement. We want to be able to sleep the sleep of Daniel. We, we want to sleep the sleep of peace and hope and trust. And we've got to build ourselves up to that. So how do we prepare? Well, think first, think first about how we've heard this story so many times in the past. So many times, at least I've heard this story preached and presented and taught with a heavy emphasis on the details of the statue. This is what this means, and this is where this points, and this is how this is. And there's been little attention given to the fact that God is in control, that God is presenting this, that God, God is giving the answer, the exact answer that he wants to give to Daniel to deliver to the king. Sometimes we spend so much time on the things that are not what the author intends to be the deep details of this. How many times have we, have we spent time memorizing scriptures? How many, how many hours have we spent memorizing whole passages of scripture just to know the scripture? Just so that we, we have it locked in our head. I know you guys, you guys know dozens Dozens and dozens of scriptures. And you can bring these things forward, but you will. More time will pass and you'll know dozens and dozens. And we know these things, but at that moment of crisis, we can't call them up. At that moment of crisis, when we have memorized the scripture, when we have memorized God's word, we have planted it in our hearts, we have called it the lamp unto our feet, and still we find ourselves in the middle of the night laying awake. Wondering if God's going to come through. Wondering if what he said is really that trustworthy. You know, we, we, we took a challenge last week, and I, and I bet you could all come up here. I won't call you up, but, but you could all come up here and recite Psalm 1. I know you can. But we, we didn't memorize that just as, as words, Right? We memorize it because we want at that moment to be able to call forward that truth. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman. Blessed is the child who does what? Who does not walk in the way of the wicked. Who does not stand with sinners. Who does not sit in the seat of mockers. But whose delight, whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And on it. He or she meditates day and night. Right? That's what we want to be able to call forward. That's the kind of trust that we have. Am I that person? Am I hanging out with sinners? Am I sitting in the seat of mockers? Am I doing those things? Then my trust is misplaced. 
You can't trust in just memorizing scriptures. You can't trust in just being able to call up a thousand words out of the Bible because here's what will happen. At that moment, when the king tells you you're about to lose your head because you can't interpret his dream, you will lay awake. You will lay awake in your bed at night going, did I memorize enough scripture? Do I know enough words out of the Bible? And the answer you want to have, the answer that brings peace and hope is that no, I trust in the big picture story of the Bible that God has promised He's setting everything right and I've read the end of the story and it says God will set everything right. Everything else that happens in between is detail. Everything else is a, a restatement that God is working. God is working. God is working. God sends Jesus. God works some more. God works some more. We come forward to this date and we can look around us. We can think of the people that you and I have known throughout our lives where God has touched them and completely changed their life. There's no other answer for it. Nothing else transformed the life of some of the people that you and I know except for God and His Spirit coming to work in there. You might be one of those people. You might be one of those people that was addicted. You might be one of those people that was headed off in a completely wrong path. You might have been the biggest atheist in the world. You may have done this, 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 this. But when God touched your life, your life was transformed. And the more that your life is transformed, the more that you trust. And the more that you trust, the more that your life is transformed. And on and on and on and on. Yeah. And that's how we develop that trust. That's how you and I become, become Daniels. That's how you and I become Johns to see these things and say, this is God at work. This is God transforming. This is how you and I are able to look at that cross and say, what happened on that cross? What happened? Well, the promise is God is working all things for good. The promise is that God is transforming and changing everything. The promise is that God is going to bring all of history to the end that he intends for it. And that's what happened on that cross. And that's what happened when we believed. And that's what happened when the Spirit enters us and takes over our lives. That's what happens when we go to bed with a problem and we simply give it to God and say, it's in your hands. Whatever you do, I know it's going to be good. Whatever you do, whatever I have to deal with, I know that in the bigger picture, you say all things are going to work for good, so I trust it. So whether I get eaten by a lion tomorrow or you give me the interpretation to a dream, I trust that that's what you intend to happen. And that, my friends, is, is what forms the core of all of Daniel here. That is the story that Daniel is telling here. You and I want to be known as trusting people, but trusting in the right thing, trusting in God, trusting in God's word, trusting in the experience of God's people, trusting that he is bringing all things to good. We want to know the peace that comes from a, a mature, second nature trust in God. That whatever God does in our life, we don't need to question it. We don't need to spend even one more second doubting that that might be the right thing. We want to be people that whatever God tells us, we trust it. Whatever he does in our life, we trust it. Whatever he says is coming down the pike in the future, we want to trust that. And we want to trust it without question, without verification, without doubt. That's the kind of people that we want to be. Because when we are, when we are those people, we will know without question that God is working all things, all things for good, despite what we encounter today, despite what we deal with. It's that being prepared to trust that will lift us up when the challenges come our way. It's this being prepared to trust that, that makes us savor the good news that God gives us even more than we already do. It's this being prepared to trust that opens us up 
to this cycle of learning to trust and trusting and learning to trust and trusting more and then trusting and then trusting even more so that no matter what comes our way, we will have complete and total trust in what God says in his word, what he's done with his people, what he's doing in our lives. It's that trust that lets us sleep through the night. It's that trust that allows us to place whatever we're dealing with in God's hands and then be at total peace. Yeah? It's that trust that lets us wake up the next day after we have turned the worst thing in our life over to God and just get up and praise Him and praise His name. Thank Him for His grace and His mercy and His love. And, and you know, as we just sang a few minutes back, to say, you are, you are without question, a good, good Father. Amen? Amen. Amen.